<laughs> Alright, I think we should finally start our lecture today. Um, thank you so much for being here, everyone. Um, I hope you have a nice week um, and everyone is safe um, in their homes. Now, um, if you could just quickly tell me that, can you see the screen? Now, before we start the lecture, um, I'd like to remind you that today is the last day for your um, assignment, um, the essay that you have to write about yourself. Um, I've been receiving the responses from you guys, and honestly, I'm amazed about the fact that um, you guys have been able to articulate yourself so well and in such concise and brief manner that um, it's very impressive. Um, and that was the purpose of the assignment also, that um, it enables you to think about yourself, your life, um, how you think, um, the present reality and where you want to be. And then from that, probably design a pathway for yourself to get to where you want. Yes, Ahmed, it's a great assignment. Um, but so far what we have done is that we have been um, studying about psychology as the field, um, its history, um, then we studied about different perceptions our mind makes up from the things around us um, and give it a meaning um, and how do we differ from each other, how our body actually contributes to what we think. We have been studying about the biological origins of our decision making and our personalities. We studied about um, brain anatomy uh, and which parts of our brain control which um, sensory actions and reactions um, and what are the rules of hormones and neurotransmitters in that. Um, we also studied about the apparent effects of personality types. Is it genetics um, or is it um, more of the acquired skills that we have? Um, and these are the things um, that we've been studying in our dis discussions about careers and IQ also. Um, Amna, Aisha is uh, making the attendance for the whole semester, so you can contact her for your uh, attendance, please. Um, so people who do not know that Aisha is doing that, kindly talk to her for her attendance. Um, anyways, um, back to our previous lecture, we've been studying about um, personality and IQ um, and what's the difference between us. So what we use is so far um, is the big five personality model that tells us um, a lot about how we differ with each other in five big different ways. And those were openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness and neuroticism. And does anyone else have a problem listening to me? Aisha, you might want to fix your um, headphone or something because I don't think um, there's anything wrong with my side. I've been using the same settings throughout the lectures. Okay, um, so today we're going to be studying a s uh, something very interesting and that was one of the foundational theories of um, psychology. Um, this is probably also the reason why people are surprised how psychologists actually know about a person's personality um, so deeply um, and they might have s uh, something to do with mind reading uh, which is not the fact. Um, the idea is that um, Psychologists do have the framework uh, for understanding other people's um, responses and reactions and values that motivate them and based on that, you know, they have studies and um, 
histories um, that point into same direction. So people are very predictable. Um, even though we might think that we are very different from each other, um, we certainly do resemble each other in many of our beliefs, our attitudes, our behaviors, um, our emotions. Um, and it's fairly easy to group people based on that, even though that might not be a good strategy uh, for treating people, but then it certainly is a good one to group them, um, not stereotyping but also group them um, in a way that maximizes their potential so today what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be studying um, why do we think the way we do why do people lie why do people make excuses um, why do we justify situations the way we look at that and for that, you have to understand uh, three different levels um, of human beings. Um, every one of us have memories of certain situations, some very vivid, some not at all. For example, um, does anyone remember uh, that when they were three years old and they had their third birthday, what day was that? I mean, can you remember your birthday as a three-year-old? And especially the day that we have. Exactly, Aisha. It's, it's very hard to remember that um, there is no possible way, even for adults, to actually remember the day that um, our birthday was, even last year. Um, so it's not possible f for you as a three-year-old remember the day of your birthday on your third birthday now even though that that might um, sound like um, it's a perfectly acceptable proposition that you do not remember the day um, but unfortunately um, on a physiological level that's not true and the brain the part of the brain that actually remembers all this information is the unconscious level now, um, in the unconscious, we do have uh, this information uh, that is stored somewhere deep down in the memory, but we are not able to access that um, because that is not very important. Mm, so if we remember everything, then it would be a huge problem which information to prioritize and which information to forget um, because we cannot handle information overload that means not every little detail of everything colors uh, pictures um, images sounds smells if we started to remember everything and all uh, um, in all possible ways of uh, thinking that and r retaining that information we will be confused because we will not have enough memory space for anything else for example, if we um, remembered, uh, for, take a, take the example of a computer. A computer has a certain amount of memory. So if we are using too many programs on computer, the RAM will be used to actually manage all these programs. But if we open up one additional program, the computer will crash because the RAM is limited. That's exact same principle that we have for our brains. If we overload our brains with information that we do not immediately require or does not um, have relevance for us, then we tend to put that information in long-term memory or even unconscious if it's um, too far back in the history. And our brain actually does that automatically. Now, the part of our brain that actually does that um, and these memories actually go deep down um, into unconscious level where there's no way to actually access that back um, that will be unconscious level so we do uh, realize that it's somewhere um, but there is no absolutely no way for us to remember that thing unless we actually you know went back to calendar saw the specific date and remember when was your birthday there is n no possible way for that and Frankly, for so many of us, it, it, this information is useless. 
Now, um, there are three basic levels of consciousness. Oh. Let's talk about um, the conscious level, um, and which is also called the ego. So human beings have these three processes always going on um, when we think about things. So the conscious level are the things um, that you actually use for testing the reality. Um, so let's use an example of um, at three in the morning, you want to eat ice cream and there's nothing at, in your fridge. Um, so what you basically do is that, you know, th there's an urge that you want to fulfill, but there are no means to do that. Now, at a pre-conscious uh, level uh, or the super ego level, um, you feel like, you know, this is something that you should be doing. Uh, and basically this urge for eating uh, immediate gratification that comes from the unconscious level you know ice cream is something that you would want to have in summers uh, and at that, that specific time so you have no control over this desire that you know you want to have ice cream at a certain time um, and this desire when becomes um, conscious and then you know that this is the moment that I want to have that um, you would immediately want to have that so basically your unconscious is telling you to crave and want this thing um, right now um, without thinking about if it's possible or not. So the part of our brain that actually mediates between um, that, you know, the, the satiation for the desire of having ice cream, um, it's called ego or the conscious level. What it does is that it tells you um, that if you want to eat ice cream, sure, you can do that. Uh, but then you have to do something about that. Now, our super ego, which is the pre-conscious level, that is the part of our brains that actually tell us what is proper to do or what should be done. So your pre-conscious actually knows that it's 3 in the morning. You cannot go outside. There will be no shops open. Um, you will have to wait until the morning when the shops are open and then you can buy and then you can have the ice cream but your id uh, which is the unconscious level tells you that whatever i think and whatever i feel and whatever i crave right now i want to have that at this moment and this is um, a continuous struggle uh, between the super ego and the id and the judge between these two that what's reality is the ego and which is the conscious level now this is the very basic simple um, explanation of how different three different levels actually interact with each other in every decision in our lives that we make about ourselves now take a little bit of a uh, more complex example of how um, we use these processes in advanced things Now, let's suppose that you want to be, um, study to become an architect. Now, um, where does it come from? You can probably think of that as an unconscious level um, desire where you like to see um, and construct new buildings. You like different shapes. You like different materials. You like different styles and angles. Um, and you understand the concept of strength. Uh, and uh, adhesive materials and things like this and acting upon that and making that as a career um, that would be something um, that you should be doing um, so that could be your basic impulse or that could be your uh, pre-conscious level thinking also for example some of your parents um, and your friends or your family might want you to uh, become architects because maybe they're architects or maybe they think beco becoming an architect is a good thing for you so what you're basically doing is that you know you have an uh, you have an ideal to become architect so that it makes everyone else happy um, so that would be your pre -con conscious level ideals in your life um, that you know if you become an architect you're going to be accepted and appreciated for that by your family and your friends and then your life is going to be um, the way it's supposed to be so your basic impulses might want that or your environment or your circle wants that they, these are two different things and if they want the same thing that's good but generally it's not the way it is 
um, generally what you want is something different from how you actually have to um, act according to society or your ideals are um, the cultural ideals of um, things are very different so what actually mediates between do these two things um, is the ego um, now your ego actually is the reality testing um, tool that you have um, for understanding the relationship between the id and your super ego and that works um, consistently to make sure that there is no conflict between these two things because if there are two conflict between two things then it deeply disturbs um, and disorients you in life and um, that means that you cannot actually become the best version of yourself um, or achieve the idealism that you have in your mind about yourself um, on the other hand um, if you do not satisfy your um, basic impulses um, and what you actually crave for um, on a very base biological and genetic level then it would this also going to be a problem because then you're actually working for someone else um, and you're willing to happily sacrifice your basic desires for societal um, acceptance uh, and what actually mediates between these two things is your conscious level ego now uh, how does that actually play out in real life so let's talk about the lies that we tell each other um, how do we defend things um, that we do and what are the basic strategies of using those defenses in different convenient situations all right so these are some of the basic mechanisms for uh, what we call the pre uh, the deep defenses uh, we use these defenses in order to convince ourselves and others and we can find a good compromise between our impulses and our idealism um, so there are different defenses that we actually use um, so if you look about um, look around you um, and actually focus on how people actually um, justify their behaviors um, how do they react to different situations um, how do people think of other people's behavior um, and then how do they make meanings out of that um, you can simply understand um, the basic origins of their arguments and then make a decision based on that and this is the field of psychology um, pretty much invented by uh, Sigmund Freud and it's called um, psychoanalysis um, what he does that um, he there's a method called free association in which the patient actually tells freely um, about his life about his opinions about his struggles about his uh, morals um, and values uh, so that there is no judgment from the therapist side and he could actually understand um, his basically basic rep repressed ideals that give insight into um, his mental makeup um, and how psychologists actually do that is through understanding their primary defenses now let's take um, one by one different defenses um, and you can identify that in your own behavior and in um, your friends and your family's behavior to see what kind of defenses they actually use now there are two defenses uh, one are called the primary or immature defenses and other are more complex defenses um, that mature people actually use now if you look at the first one um, we have um, defense called acting out um, what you're actually thinking or if there is a conflict between what you think is proper and what you think is improper that makes you angry and then you start acting out and um, behaving rudely or you start swearing at other people you become angry um, and you do not have a effective way of coping up with your own anger for example you know if you're um, walking on the sidewalk and there's rain and you know there's some water on the street so there's a car that goes by and you know uh, spills water on your um, uniform or whatever dress you're 
um, wearing then that's something that's bound to make you very unhappy um, even to the point where you're very angry now there are different ways of coping with anger because there are some things that you can control and there are some things that are not in your control so there is no way that you can control the behavior of someone who's driving a car and, and is irresponsible and does not know that driving fast um, with a puddle of water would actually throw water on people walking in the sidewalk so there's nothing you can do about that but what you can do is that you can understand your own response to these um, uh, situations so that you do not become angry and by the way we're uh, our meeting time is only 10 minutes left so uh, if we discontinue I'll send you the new link now that's uh, one of the way of uh, showing a primary defense um, that is very immature so once you grow up you find out that you know the damage has been done your uniform is spoiled um, you're a little bit wet but instead of actually going out and fighting with people what you do is that you know you clean your own breast you know you, you try to minimize the damage uh, because what's done is done and there's nothing you can do about that and there's no need for actually fighting uh, because you cannot undo what's been done now just another example of that um, would be aggression um, now why do people actually become angry and why do y they attack other people now there are different ways for that one reason is that you know if you think that you attack other and you beat others before they do it to you then you're going to be in a better position you'll either feel good about yourself um, or you will think that you know others are not smart enough um, or you will have um, won a debate that you think um, you're superior in I mean and that might be true but the fact is that you know there is no need for aggression for that for example if you're right and you know you're right um, there's no need to actually rub that in other people's face uh, because you can do it um, in more civilized manner by convincing them that you know you can evaluate your response and you can evaluate their response and then you can discuss which response is better in which ways because there's always a gray area between right and wrong so in some ways you might be right and in some ways someone else might be right and there doesn't have to be a one single winner and there does not have to be one loser for a situation to become fruitful because what happens is that when you are doing a discussion um, everyone is learning from that so no one's absolutely right so after that discussion you're going to be a different person and they're going to be a different person and you would understand every each other everyone's point in the debate and that would probably make you a more aware person but instead if you chose to attack other people and uh, that's going to generate aggression from their side and negativity from their side So not only are you going to lose a debate even if you have won the debate that is going to still leave you with a bitter feeling about other people so that's going to mar your relationship with them so what's important for you winning or losing a relationship so there's always either or situation here so instead of doing that what we what mature defense is um, is to actually talk about things um, and see the response of other people to your argument and if that's a um, educated discussion oriented response you can have that if not you can leave them with their own ideals before they're actually ready to explore and see the differences and that would be a mature strategy um, now w another very immature response is blaming so if you're in a situation which you do not like and you primarily think that it's someone else's fault and there was nothing wrong from your side in that situation uh, you might find it very convenient to tell people that it's absolutely your fault and that might accompany with um, a lot of abusive behavior or let's say um, disrespectful behavior now but in every situation there is always a different way of looking at things there's always um, a little fault um, from everyone's side to get into a situation that's not good for everyone in that situation 
So that means, for example, if you're waiting for a friend and you know he shows up late and you've been waiting for there for a long time and you, you know, you blame them for being late and disrespectful and things like this. Now there could be a genuine reason for that, um, and there might not be. Uh, that means that you know if if you have been w waiting there and your friend genuinely meant it to come late and you know uh, to annoy you, that could be one reason. Yes, Saad, everything has been uploaded on the Google Drive folder. Um, now, you look at the situation in another way. What is um, that one thing that actually makes you mad about the situation? Um, is it the fact that your friend is late? But, you know, if you look at it in another way, have you, you yourself never been late in your life? And that's not true. Um, you know, for every... For most of the people, I don't know about you, but you know, for most people, they've been late um, to different events and many different situations. So if you judge yourself very leniently for being late, why do you judge your friend um, so harshly about being late? Now, if there's another situation and he intends to actually do that, um, then you have to question your whole relationship. Then why would your friend actually intentionally become uh, come late to annoy you? Because, you know, you must have done something very wrong in your friendship that, you know, he's gotten to the point where we actually physically made a plan to annoy you. And that's not a good, healthy relationship. And if it's not, then you have to focus on the relationship and you should not be actually blaming others for doing that. Now, a third situation can be uh, where you're overreacting to the situation. For example, if you're standing in the sun um, in summers waiting for your friend, I mean, you're making it more hard for yourself than it you, it needs to be. So what you can do is that, you know, you can sit in a cafe or in a shop uh, or anywhere um, where you could find some shadow. You, you know, you can have some water, you can have some juice, you can listen to some music and, you know, wait for them instead of, you know, making it so hard. Because what makes it um, intolerable is the fact that you have been suffering all this time that you have been waiting. And it doesn't have to be that way. So there's always, you know, blame from both sides. So do not be fast enough to put blame to other people when you cannot actually fairly judge yourself with, by the same standard. Um, another way of doing that um, is delusion. Um, and that that's something that human beings do to themselves very, very, very often. Uh, and it's a very immature defense. You know, we lie to ourselves about the reality of the situation. Now, in many situations, people think that, you know, if they're in a terrible situation in life, um, if there's something that they cannot control, um, they distort their reality to fit um, their hopelessness in the situation instead of doing something about that. So what happens is that um, you lie to yourself that things are going to be better. Um, there's going to be someone from the outside who's going to actually come and um, extricate you from this situation. Um, you ha do have the means to actually fix this situation whenever you want. And that not might be the true truth. And this delusion and lying um, and deceiving yourself um, becomes a reality in itself and the problem with this that it, it's very good um, short-term strategy that you can keep telling yourself lies and be actually content with this but in the long term um, there is no way to escape the consequences of reality and if you do not face the reality as it is um, as of now um, then there are even bigger problems that you're going to be facing when the reality becomes a manifest. And this delusion actually becomes a huge problem. Now, this is also one form of immature defense. Now, there are a lot of other uh, different defenses um, that you can use. Um, so I can briefly, you know, skim over that in order to give you an idea. Uh, and that could be your um, assignment um, like ungraded assignment that you can notice around you and by the way we're only one minute left so I'll send you the new link 
Um, so what we do is that you can go out and see how these pe how people actually use these defenses in order to um, m make meanings out of their lives and in their situations and 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 instead of uh, facing reality, they use these things to explain themselves in a very unrealistic manner. And my argument is that that um, you know at ev any point in our lives we do have to make um, self-defense mechanisms to keep our sanity but it doesn't have to be um, immature defenses uh, we could deal it um, in a very dignified all right um, let's start from where we actually left off um, so what I was telling you is that you know um, instead of using the immature defenses what we can do is that we can learn to cope with this in different situations and many people actually do um, with life um, as they mature as they become older they do realize the consequences of their immature defenses um, and they learn to cope up with the situation in a manner which is dignified and acceptable and that is what our um, Th that is what the struggle is between our conscious mind and the subconscious and unconscious. Um, so getting back to um, the immature defenses quickly because we have other things to cover. So let's go and talk about um, the rest of um, the primary defenses. Um, now one of the situation is and that's very very basic. I mean uh, school children do that. Um, and that's called denial. Um, so I think you have all heard um, the poem in nursery and in play groups when uh, you know the uh, mother actually asked the children uh, baby baby um, what's in your mouth and she says, Sh Sh I don't even actually remember that poem anymore sugar in your mouth and actually the child says there's no sugar and then, then she asked her to open her mouth and there was actually sugar in the baby's mouth um, and that's outright denial that um of the situation that you know she doesn't have sugar when actually it is so it's it's still lying so this denial of the reality is also a very um primitive defense um uh, in which i mean you can lie to get out of the situation but then it's not a fact and it's very soon it's caught so actually only children do that they don't um elders do not do that in a way that they can actually get and got that easily now um there's another thing that's called dissociation once you're in a situation where you do not have the power to get out of that situation and it's very tough and it's it's disturbing and you know it disorients you um then out of a sudden you become very numb about the situation you do not feel anything anymore um you don't think there's anything wrong with the situation you don't think there's anything right so you simply do not find yourself present in that situation and you you let yourself float into a mod which we call autopilot you, you don't think about anything anymore and um there's another situation in which um what we do is that we change the whole story um of the reality i mean y you fit your um, story um, to a distorted version of reality guys I've already um, removed one of the guys from the class so please not don't make me do that once more now what we do is that there is a distortion um, of um, the story um, in a manner that actually suits us and that's not real and that becomes a huge problem um, when we put ourselves in a situation where we actually, instead of realizing the situation, um, you simply change the story. Um, for example, if you do not want to go to university someday, uh, so what you will do is that, you know, you will um, stay home and you'll send a message that you're not coming to university today because your mother um, actually wants you to stay at home uh, because she's sick. Now, the reality of the fact is that your mother only told you that, you know, um, sh she is going to make breakfast a little later because she has not slept well. And, you know, she, ne she needs some time before she does that. 
and that does not actually mean that you know she asks you to stay at home and do not go to university because she is sick and you have to take care of her so what you're doing is that you're actually changing the story to and you're distorting um, the reality and facts in order to get the way that you want to have uh, now there's another way um then that you can lie to yourself uh, and that's called emulation so what you do is that um that you emulate yourself in another person you copy yourself to another person and you think that you know you are that person and um you apply all the rules and lessons and values and morals from that person instead of realizing that you are a different person so not everything that happens to them will happen to you um a very common method at least for uh and that's more common in women than men, uh, which is to fantasize and go into other worlds. So they hide themselves in movies and cartoons um, and dramas and music um, and books to r face the hard and bitter facts in life um, and try to create a story out of that that's very pleasing and that's very emotional. Um, and that has nothing to do with the reality. So that escape into the fantasy is called fantasizing. Um, and then we have idealiz idealization with other people. We tend to believe that other people are doing better than us. Uh, we we think that you know sm uh, people who are rich, people are who are more handsome, or people are who are apparently more successful are really that happy. And that simply is not the fact because you do not know them. Um, and if you knew a small thing, some small things about them. And you, if you knew them personally, you would realize that they are as uh, vulnerable human beings as you are. And there's no need for you to idealize them because they are living a separate life of their own and they chose their own um, miseries and they ch chose their own blessings and you know they chose their own values. And what you think of success might be very different for them and even for you and you know even though you think that you they are in a better position than you are maybe once you are in their position you're not going to appreciate that at all um there's another um defense that we play on ourselves, and that is um identification if you think that you know other people are going to support you in what you believe even though you know for sure that these people are not good for you you identify with them. And this is why we have bad company. This is why we have bad friends. Sometimes people get along with each other. Not exactly get along with each other, but they pretend to get along with each other uh, to make sure that they're popular, to make sure that they're accepted, to make sure that, you know, these other people are going to... Uh, I mean, they hope that these other people are going to protect them once they're in the situation where they would actually need some help and support. And that might not be the best strategy um, in identifying the people who are sincere to you. Um, another uh, thing that you can do um, to delude yourself is internalization. Uh, to think of certain situations um, and negative events and lessons from that uh, and make them into your belief system. You think of them, them as ultimate universal truth. And that's not the fact. Now, we've talked a lot about primary defenses, uh, but let's talk about something, how mature people actually deal, deal with life. So what's the proper manner of dealing with things? Um, or these uh, defenses that older people use, adults actually use. I mean, not all of them um, are going to be applicable to you or not all of them are being used by um, adult people, but these are generally considered to be excuses that elder people use now one of them is um, altruism so example if you do something negative for example if you rob a bank um, you kill someone you're um, in a ransom situation what you do is that uh, instead of talking about what you have done wrong and instead of um, accepting it and being um, guilty and shameful for that what you do is that you start talking about the nice thing that you have done for the world and that's for their own benefit uh, for example if you kill someone instead of you know being ashamed of that and you know uh, apologizing for that what you do is that um, you say that I've done so many good things and you know this one thing that I've done that's also for the 
public benefit and because this person was dangerous to the society and you know i do not care about myself but i care about everyone else way more than i do about myself and that is um hiding your bad deeds um, with your good deeds uh, in uh, disguise of altruism um, another way of doing uh, mature defense is cynicism that um, you are very um, negative about things that other do um, and others others feel um, and then you are very skeptic about that I think everything what they're telling is false I mean that might be the case that that's what they're telling is false but then you do not have to deny or reject their proposition from the start because everyone has a right to actually explain what they're thinking and the reasons behind um, their postulation and if you do not give them this opportunity of audience and you do not understand their um, argument and then you deny them in the beginning because whatever comes from that person is wrong then that's called cynicism and that denies us, us of the opportunity of having an intellectual discussion with uh, people we do not understand them they do not understand us and that's a that's a very vicious negative loop so if you keep denying people you know you will end up having no one to talk to and when you have no one to talk to then you will think that the word is bad because everyone is bad and if you think that everyone is bad then the word is not a place where which is worth living and if you reach this d dangerous conclusion that word is not a place to live and everyone is bad and to get out of it you have to kill yourself ultimately or find a way in which either you can take your revenge from the word or on yourself and that's certainly a pathway to disaster so cynicism is something that kills you very si silently um, one more defense is that people actually use uh, and by the way all these complex uh, defenses um, one way of a uh, uh, place where you can find all these defenses being used um, is the TV discussions between politicians because politicians are very smart in what defenses they actually use and they know what defenses actually work on people's uh, brains um, and they can consistently lie and cheat uh, and hide uh, and uh, promote their good behavior instead of accepting um, their bad deeds and they would use all of these defenses um, in a manner uh, which pleases other people but then generally they they are a shameful covering up um, of their uh, immoral behavior so one other thing um, that you've probably seen um, most politicians actually do at one point or another it's called devaluation what it does is that you know it mitigates the scale on which you've actually uh, destroyed people's lives for example um, many of you must have heard that you know there's a severe drought in um, s interior Sindh where people do not have enough uh, food and uh, water and electricity and people tend to die out of hunger there um, and that's a very sad situation but if you ask any of the politicians um, in that province about the situations in there they would rather say that there are only s few people um, who refuse to get out of their villages um, and their desert environment and you know come to the cities mm, where they can be served so that's their fault and you know there's nothing big about that there's only a small number so what they're actually doing is they're minimizing the amount of damage that has actually been caused um, to people and the destruction the scale of destruction they're simply um, making it look like it's nothing and that's and it takes a lot of uh, dishonesty and lack of concern for other people's lives and in order to be able to do that but it is still you know it's considered um, a mature defense that um, seasoned liars actually do um, another very common way of doing uh, uh, mature defense is the humor or simply make jokes out of things um, for example if I ask you to um, do an assignment um, and you're supposed to be submitting it today uh, and instead of submitting assignment to me you're actually making jokes about that well the whole Pakistan is you know s sitting at home doing nothing you know they have are worried about their life 
um so i might as well you know see some funny cat videos on youtube and you know enjoy life and you should exactly do that also do not worry about assignments so you know, these actually making it uh, a humorous situation in which instead of uh, doing your job what you're doing is that you're um, giving it a very lighter and fun tone um, and people generally use that you know, they make fun out of situations that are very serious and grave um, and one of the excuses of smart people um, is that um, they use a self-defense mechanism called intellectualization so what they do is that they start making everything a philosophical discussion uh, so for example it'll if um, one of you actually came to me and said what what career should i actually choose and we've been talking about you know your uh, individual uh, personality type and you know the, your iq scores and we'll be talking about different professions and what you like and what you don't um, what you do is that uh, instead of focusing on um any productive suggestion that i m might give you what you do is you start making it a philosophical discussion so for example if i tell you okay you tend to be um, quite good with things you know your maths is good um, you're a very analytical person why not you try to become a computer engineer and instead of you know focusing focusing on that what you do is that you know you intellectualize about things you know well what is the purpose uh, of life in becoming a software engineer and not being able to think about real issues in life well you can do that simultaneously but you see the pattern of argument what you're doing is that you're trying to make it a um philosophical discussion instead of a uh, matter of fact and uh, real discussion uh, because you cannot over complicate things than they really are you don't have to make it uh, a situations a situation of ultimate right and ultimate wrong you know it it's not a discussion um that has to be that complicated now so you see these are some of the complex um defense mechanisms that we actually use in our own lives we also use um, different ways um, of making sense of things um, around us and how we defend ourselves in front of others some of them are mature ways other of them are not uh, but word is a beautiful colorful and uh, surprising place so we have different people with different capabilities it's just like a rainbow with different colors um, with different talents and some people that we generally think um, are smarter they use mature self defenses they are very well settled in life and people look up to them um, they generally are not that smart um, and on the other hand simple people would use prim primarily um, defenses that are uh, suitable for children and they're not functional they have some kind of handicap even they could um, in some situations develop um, a certain talent um, that will out um, do everyone else um, so let's talk briefly about something um, in psychology uh, which is very interesting it's called um, the um, savant phenomena um, these are generally people who are handicapped who cannot walk um, or sometimes eat on their own so there have to be people around them who take care of them um, and the phenomena is called the savant syndrome um, and it hints uh, a dormant potential within us all uh, well the key research ongoing is how to tap those hidden skills without brain injury or disease um, so what happens is that in these situations these people who are generally incapable of um, doing uh, normal things in life like eating or uh, walking due to a brain injury or disease uh, one of their skills um, um, out of proportion becomes so uh, refined and so impressive that um, these people outperform general creative people for example there's one guy um, what happens is that you know he's normally not able to sp uh, spend a healthy life um, but he has a certain gift um, and that gift is that you know um, he's blind so he cannot see so what happens is that if he listens to any song being played um, only once he's able to not only understand and remember the tones and sound and reflections he's able to play that on piano 
only by listening it to once. And it's been claimed that he underst uh, he remembers thousands of thousands of tunes um, and he's still a child. And it's unbelievable to imagine that, you know, normally handicapped people who do not have these primary defenses, um, they're not mature at all, uh, they're not able to even function on their own, they can actually do that. Um, there's a famous movie called Rain Man um, by Dustin Hoffman um, in which um, there's uh, a similar guy with Samant syndrome with unbelievable talents. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a brief uh, movie on um, Savant uh, phenomena and how it works. Uh, I'm also going to paste the link for that so you understand the concept uh, if you are not able to watch the video. So I'll just go ahead and share it. Uh, and for people who cannot hear that, um, you sh can go and watch the video on YouTube and you can come back and um, see that. Uh, for people who are here, uh, just let me know if you can hear the voice. All right, thank you so much. I hope uh, many of you have um, seen the video. Um, and if not, um, you can go ahead and see that um, again after the lecture. Um, now, I've also posted um, this video on our course page on my website. Um, I also made an assignment um, announcement yesterday about um, the IOB LMS. I've uh, posted um, our assignments and our uh, course outlines there also so if people would want to um, check that out you can do that now um, the purpose of the video was to tell you actually that you know um, psychology is a very divided subject um, many people think of that it's the replacement of um, religion in Western societies where they actually uh, didn't want to have religion but they still are not able to answer the questions um, that are related to uh, human spirit and uh, things that you cannot actually measure uh, through scientific tools and thus came psychology in order to explain um, our differences um, and how we think and uh, the immaterial part of our lives and all um, these theories are actually the attempt in order to understand our behaviors um, our interaction with others uh, finding a place for ourselves in the world and finding meaning out of that now um, there are people um, which are very interesting cases like these savants um, who generally do not use um, these uh, defense mechanisms and all these theories do not actually explain um, their existence and how their minds function uh, but um, this is the beauty um, of religion that Allah has made different people in a way um, that there's always an exception to the rule uh, and there are always rules uh, for the exceptions um, and this is um, something that we um, as Muslims need to realize um, that um, we can only explain people to a certain extent and there's only certain things um, that we can say with certainty um, and we have very sophisticated statistical tools to measure these differences um, and actually use that to make ourselves better version of, of ourselves um, but there's ultimately um, not a single answer for every question that um, we might have about other people's um, mental makeup. Everyone is an individual person. A and even though that we have gone very far in terms of psychological measurement, uh, we're still very far off um, in ultimately predicting every possible aspect of human life. Um, and with that... Um, I conclude the session on um, conscious and unconscious mind in which we studied about how our minds actually uh, minimize the conflicts um, and um, um, discord between our um, unconscious um, impulses um, and our idealistic um, subconscious and find a meaning out of that so that we do not find ourselves disoriented. Uh, now, 
we also studied about um, savants um, for those these uh, descriptions do not uh, fit very well and it does not explain their behaviors and that's uh, one of the mysteries um, and you know, s and the jury is still out on um, how we should actually explain these people um, now uh, that would be it for today if you guys have any questions please please free feel free to ask all right sweet uh, so what we can do is that um, I'll be posting the recording for the lecture um, soon um, all the materials that have been used um, in the lecture will be uploaded to the Google classroom um, if you want to read more about um, the text and the video that we have seen it's also always be available on my um, course web page um, and goes without saying if you have any question at all just send me a message and uh, we'll pick it from there um, thank you so much for today um, remember today the last day for submitting the assignment again uh, don't be late and uh, that will be it for today Well, that's a very good question, uh, Mara. You know, people do switch between different defenses in different situations. Um, for example, if uh, we are very stressed and anxious about certain situations, we might not use our normal mature defenses and resort to simple defenses because we have panicked and we have forgotten about um, how socially acceptable or how um, normal people react. So this is why you see older people, when they get old, you know, start behaving like children because they lose sense of their um, um, adult balance uh, and some people argue that that's because of the brain damage when you become older other people think that you know um, it's just part of life um, but that there is no definitive um, answers on um, how to explain their degraded uh, self-defense mechanisms Um, yes, yeah, so Amara, we have a complete lecture on psychopathology, so wait for that. All right, then, thank you so much. And if you have any other children, uh, oh, sorry, I was reading your question. Um, if you have any um, questions about you behaving as children, you know, feel free to drop me a message. Thank you so much and have a good day.